Look, platform economy, a lot to, uh, to digest. Uh, it worries me. It worries me. I mentioned earlier that you know, Thailand, we have a cliche, the 4.0 is a cliche, so it's talked about a lot. Some people say 0.4. Uh, but you know, these are the details. This is uh, un unbundling uh, the entire concept and challenge. I like the platform economy uh, conceptualization, and we will be interested to hear your experience in government uh, when we come back to you later. Uh, your last two or three slides, I think, uh, about cybersecurity, about the um, geopolitical balance of uh, connectivity ownership. I mean, it's astounding that the U.S. would own 44% of this. We think of uh, internet as uh, up here in you know somewhere, but in fact, it's it's in the cables, it's underground. So the U.S. has a structural advantage here. Uh, cybersecurity in our region, Singapore is most advanced. We we are far far behind, but. Uh, you know, it depends who we compare ourselves to. Let me come to uh, Dr. Chai Pong Pong Panit. Uh, Dr. Chai Pong is the director of the Sassin Management Consulting, and I will say that uh, his uh, former colleague is uh, the Minister, Minister of Science and Technology. And uh, we, we do have a Minister for Digital Economy and Society. I don't know what he does, uh, or in his name, but we, we're very good. We also have a ministry called Human Security. We, we, you know, we have a very uh, advanced uh, names. Uh, but in terms of substance, uh, Dr. Shai Pong Sassin is the has been known and uh, not not by many, but but is a brain trust of government policy making. I know from uh, Dr. Somkit, uh, Dr. Sawit Mason C. I had conversations with him when I see this 4.0 the EEC. Uh, it's very much a uh, deja vu. It's like we've talked about this before. So he's actually in a position implementing some of his ideas from uh, you know management consulting side. Uh, so Dr. Shaipong, what, what do you think? Uh, share with us some of your ideas and reflections so, for 15 you. minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Chinan. Um, maybe I'm sharing with you my involvement uh, in, with the, some of the government agencies uh, working on some of these concepts. Uh, in fact, you know, it's quite rare for a business school to have consulting units, and we are probably the only one who do it quite seriously in Thailand. Uh, so normally we provide service, services to the government uh, in terms of policy recommendation. We provide service to state-owned enterprise and also private sector, and we see this as a linkage between theory and practice. So we do like have full-time staff working on projects. Uh, my involvement in, in, let's say, you know, this Thailand 4.0 actually weighs back to 2003 when I joined Sassin for the first time. And at that time, I think the government had have an, an idea of actually raising competitiveness of Thailand. You know, at, before, you know, people never talk about competitiveness. There's no ranking at all. Uh, there's no unit that actually responsible for Thailand competitiveness, even in ESDB. So we actually go there, went there, actually help NESDB setting up this unit. Yeah. And we invite Professor Michael Porter to work on, on the issues. Uh, I'll probably you know, spend about 10, 15, 15 minutes uh, talking about my journey you know, and how I see things, how it involved into Thailand 4.0. You know. uh, maybe I think this is important chart. Uh, first of all, Thailand has been in the middle income trap for the past 30 years. That's a long time, you know, and it's actually defined by the World Bank. You know, we are in that group, we have about 100 countries. And if you look at over time, I think Thailand actually passed low income country in 19, I think, uh, 88. So this is about 30 years ago. And we still stuck in the middle there. And we cannot, you know, see the light at the end of the tunnel yet. Why protocol? You know, you went from there and then actually go beyond the boundary. And you see some of the countries like Singapore, Korea, they actually surpass that. But Thailand is still stuck in the middle. Uh, I, I get my team, my team actually working on modeling things like that. And you know, just estimate how long would it take for Thailand to be a high, high income country. Right? So it really depends on you know, your assumption, of course. Let's say you assume that if we have the growth rate like 3%, which is like normal, it would take you another 20 years to be a high income country. But if Thailand can have 5% GDP growth, it will be another 10 years. But 5% is actually quite challenging, right? If you know, many of you would know. So can Thailand have 
can grow economy for 5%? I think that's, that's a hard question to ask. It's quite hard because we are in the trap. You know, if you look at, you know, the position, positioning of Thailand, you know, the lower tier compete in low cost, you have a bunt, a, a abundant of cu countries that are actually providing that kind of services. You know, China, maybe West Coast, you know, Myanmar coming up and coming, Vietnam, of course, you know, Laos and people in this region, I think they provide a kind of uh, uh, competitiveness, if you like. On the top, you also been suppressed by, you know, those uh, high value added countries like the US, UK, Korea, and Japan, and China in some of the sector. And that's actually very hard for country in the middle income trap to actually move beyond that. But, you know, having said that, it's actually, it's a no choice thing, right? You have to actually move up the ladders. So the question is that how can we actually move from, you know, the investment driven economy to uh, innovation driven economy? So to provide more unique value uh, 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 to, 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 to the market. Right? And you look, you know, in, in order to do that, you have to look at the trend as well. And things moving very fast now, you know. Professor Anna talking about exponential, things moving very fast. And we see things moving very fast. And, you know, the past five years, I think the change has been actually more than the past 20 years. And, and of course, there are many trends, many factors that, that contribute to that. I think today we discuss about technology and digitization. Of course, there are many other issues, but that alone has an impact, immense impact on many industries. You know, and you know, the industry that actually Thailand thought that we are quite good at, for example, automotive industry, thing would change from now. You know, uh, many other industries would change completely from now. So, uh, having that in mind, Thailand need to do something, obviously. Moreover, if you look at the, the speed of change, you know, uh, people you know, believe that in the next few years, I think less than 10 years, computing power will match the human brain. Right? And that's had a lot of implication for business. Right? The business will completely change. If you look at, you know, they have a competition uh, between IBM Watson, and this is a quiz show, and Watson won. Right? And then there's a robotics that come in, become, you know, like a who? human right now. And then all those wide recognition technology, AI, machine learning. Now that have also have implica implication to future of job. Some of the job might not exist. You, know, you might not need a secretary anymore. You just talk to that thing, and then they actually arrange everything for you. In terms of EV and automotive sector, we're talking about disruption. This we see as a deep disruption, and this is, because, you know, for Thailand, this is a threat to the Thai economy as well, because I think, you know, auto sector is one of the largest uh, industry in Thailand, and we thought that we are very good at it, you know. And EV has changed, you know, uh, you look at Mercedes, Toyota, and, and Volkswagen, so now that they're going to launch a lot of EV cars in 2020. And then, you know, the technology actually moving from, you know, a kind of, uh, human driving and to autonomous driving, self-driving car. And that's had an impact to, to, uh, to Thailand because if you look at the supply chain of the Thai auto industry, we have you know, uh, 18 car manufacturer in Thailand. That's, that's uh, the brand owner assembler if you like. We have eight motorcycle makers. Yep. I think almost all the car makers are in, in Thailand. And uh, we have also, you know, the supply chain of, of the auto industry, which is actually quite large. You know, we have more than a thousand companies. You know, tier one is about 700 companies. Tier two is about uh, another, another 2,000 companies. This is a lot of companies. And if you look at EV, right, it not gonna do revolutionize uh, uh, the car industry. Why? Because the parts, if you have only you know, 20, 200 moving parts compared to cars, you have 2,000 moving parts. Meaning what? That supply chain maybe not exist anymore. We don't need that. Now, how, how Thailand would respond to that? That would be a key thing. Very difficult question. And this existing facility, existing resource we already have here in Thailand. And the, 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 the speed of change is really fast. If you're talking about three, four years, in going to change to EV, then Thailand uh, will, will have some problem. 
Another one that we see as a disruption is the cashless society. And this is the number in, in, in China alone, right? If you look at the speed of change for five years, the, the speed that people picking up using mo mobile phone uh, apps as a way of payment. And uh, my, my friend see this picture, actually he explained himself, he's a banker. And he went to China, see big club, you know, uh, asking for money using mobile phone, QR code. And he said, this is the end of retail banking. And that's exactly the case in Thailand. If you look at the number of branches alone that we're using uh, this year, K-Bank, I think a few, almost uh, 50, 60 branches that they, they've been closed down. SCB, the same thing, any other banks. So you see that kind of disruption and it's quite real. It's coming very soon. And that has impact to all business. If you look at the macro number, this is the life expectancy of company. You know, company also have life. Human being have life. We, we maybe with age about 60 years, 70 years old. But if you look at trend, you know, since 19, 1940, average company life expectancy expectancy reduced from about 70 years now to about 20 or, or 12 years in 2025. So the life cycle is really short, but actually we live longer. So uh, I think maybe we are the one who are suffer. <laughs> and in terms of policy, industrial policy, have to, to be aware of that. And you know, you, you cannot expect companies would stay for let's say 100 years. That won't be the case anymore. And then Thailand have to do something to reflect on that. So we thought about this S curve. You know, in, you know, when I involved uh, with NESB, we, we, we address five strategic industries for Thailand. We talk about like kitchen of the world. Food is very important and we are big in food industry. Second, we talk about Detroit by Asia, Thailand as a Detroit by Asia. So we, you know, put a lot of investment, put a lot of resource to promote those kind of industry. Of course, tourism, fashion, that's a big as well. And then, you know, very small but very important, which is software industry. And we've been actually trying to emphasize on those sectors for the last, well, to 2000, 2010, I would say. Of course, there are political turmoil and things like that. But, you know, these five industries are still quite important. But that, you know, things are going to change. So with this new government, we're talking about Thailand 4.0. So we're trying to find a new segment for Thailand to compete in the future. Right? Auto as an auto, the traditional auto would not, would not survive. I think so. We have to buy something next generation of automotive, which of course a lot of investment, a lot of promotion, a lot of incentives for uh, companies in Thailand to, to put in that area. That's you know in this segment for five uh, industry, we, we, we think maybe that's our first S curve, and the second S curve after ten years we're talking about robotics. So at least here we have some base from the target uh, industry in the past, so that we actually can leverage the resource that we have to promote the new first S curve. And from jumping here to there, I think maybe it's a bit too difficult for Thailand, but having you know, the first set and you know, after 10 years, we have another set of, of the strategic industry to focus on. So at least we have a target. We have a target. And uh, if you look at uh, another flagship of, of Thailand, in order to do this, all the, all the S curve thing, Innovation is a key. I appreciate what you're talking about, innovation and things like that. But you know, to create an ecosystem that foster innovation is not, it's not easy. It's not easy. So uh, our government actually you know, uh, put in place all the mechanisms to promote this EEC, Eastern Economic Corridor, uh, to drive this Thailand 4.0. You know? And you look inside, there's two things happening in there. One is what we call EECI. Eastern Economic Corridor of Innovation. So that's, you know, uh, trying to promote, you know, the, the, the uh, S-curve industry that I'm talking about to be in that area, so in Riong area. And then another, another uh, area we call uh, Digital Park. That's more on technology, ICT, Internet of Things, and things like that. Yeah. And here, in fact, we actually develop a new city, you know, uh, with having a new zone. So last week, if you follow the news, we just finished the bidding. SMC also get uh, be part of the study also, getting the bidding of the high-speed rail uh, from that connecting three airports from uh, Don Mung, Subhanapum, and then Uttapau. So that we reach out, you know, and building a new city. So from 
from Suvarnabhumi to Uttapawa would take less than an hour. So it's quite convenient. Yes, everything finished and done. But of course, this is you know, purely coming from the government side to push this thing, you know, uh, to realize this thing. Of course, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot more to be done. It's also connected the strategy of linking, you know, uh, the, the region. If you look at the location of uh, EEC, it connects Davai on the west and to Cambodia, Cambodia and Vietnam, to Ho Chi Minh City on the east-west corridor. Also connect to the north from Laos, from China, and down to, to, to Bangkok and, 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 and EEC area. And this is probably the largest investment in ASEAN right now. Uh, so I think the government tried to put a lot of things in here. But I think, you know, as Professor Anna said, this is not easy. Going forward, you know, it's about, you know, whether we can create attractive business environment uh, that foster in innovation or not. Meaning, I think what, what my top priority would be the, the, the skill labor. We're talking about innovation and things like that. If you don't have laborers, you don't have uh, quality workforce, in terms of quantity as well. I think you know Thailand need to do something on education side. Not so sure, you know. We meant to be see uh, political environment. You know, next month, uh, next next month, right? You know, ne next two months, we see uh, what's happening. But you know, hopefully, you know things are get more stabilized. Uh, we're talking about, you know, when we're talking about uh, developing the new S curve, it's not, it's not going to be domestic market anymore. Uh, it's going to be global market. So uh, whether we can reform our trade policies that link up or open up the market uh, 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 to, 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 to larger markets. Legal regulation also. And the last one is, is the government reform. You know, people talk about Thailand 4.0 and government is maybe 1.0 at the moment, so uh, uh, something that, that Thailand needs to, to do on that. So that's probably the end of my part. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chai Pong. Um, you're a former minister. I want to just uh, acknowledge a couple of other former ministers in the room. The Kun Kasit Dasantut, His Excellency Kasit Pirom, former foreign minister, and uh, our former uh, deputy finance minister, Dr. Pisit Liatam, who went to government and returned to academia. He's uh, the, the Dean of Effective Economics, I think, at, the, at Chiang Mai. Look, um, you know, so we don't lack ideas. We don't lack ideas, you can see. There's a plan. Uh, what we have lacked, unlike previous kind of cool governments, you know, governments with doing military, gov military rule, is a kind of a, a state autonomy. So people like Dr. Chai Pong and, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Witt and so on, they would be kind of protected from the vested interest, right, to implement, to formulate the, these ideas, operationalize them, put them into action. But in fact, the last couple of years, we've not seen that. We've seen a politicization, um, penetration of vested interests, uh, which, uh, which is a pity, because we don't lack the know-how, we don't lack the ideas. Um, I'll come back to you uh, later, and I would like to you think about, one question we would have is, how do you garner the political support, political support necessary to launch this kind of you know policy paradigm, platform economy without all these vested interests uh, opposing and resisting. Um, so we'll come back to, to to you on that. In the meantime, uh, I'll move over to uh, Dr. Pavida Baranon for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Particularly welcome uh, Dr. Anna here on the panel this morning. We've been on panels uh, in cities around the world, but this is the first time that uh, I have the opportunity to receive her on my home ground, and uh, so that's a very big pleasure. Uh, when I saw the title, and I thought that this is a very big title, at first I was not going to present any PowerPoint because I know that Dr. Titinam is not very fond of PowerPoint. But uh, I realized that I'm speaking with uh, two professors from business schools, and I know the culture of a uh, business school professor. So at least I thought I would just put the summary of my thought on, on the PowerPoint. You can uh, uh, look at them sometime and, and listen to me on this end sometimes. Uh, when Dr. Titinan asked uh, what are the lessons that could be learned, and I, I think that you know, the scenario is yet 
to be established so that we can really derive lessons. But what I plan to do today is to address the lessons that should be thought about further from three levels. The first is the firm level, and I call this challenges rather than lessons. And the second level, I would address this as an industry level. And the third level, I uh, consider this as a country level challenges. And uh, each of them would be some of the aspects that I call syndromes that we tend to suffer when we discuss disruption and digitalization. But before I start on all that, let me uh, state where I'm coming from when I address these issues. I think that uh, when we talk about geopolitic and geoeconomic disruption, this is already taking place. The changing of production, the changing of uh, global value chain because of uh, improved technology and all that is already taking place. The uh, changing geopolitics recently is already taking place. So when we put both geopolitical change together with digital disruption, I think we are seeing a double whammy of what it means to be countries like Thailand, caught in the middle of income trap, being uh, emerging economies as well. And when I talk about countries like Thailand, I refer specifically to countries that have relied on uh, their economic development model that uh, look at the part of the global value chain. They play mainly the role in the uh, manufacturing part of the global value chain because these are emerging economies that are not yet there at the level of the R&D and innovation driven economy as uh, Dr. Chai Pong has mentioned. So those are sort of to my, uh, how should I say, the, the underlying forces that we are looking at Thailand and Asia from those two things. And here I go into my lessons. And I think uh, for the firm level, it's great that uh, we can hear Dr. Anna put out a big picture of the ecosystem that will change because of the digital disruption and how we can see market differently and all that. She is very hopeful. I might be a little bit more uh, cautious because when Anna talks about this digital disruption, she is actually looking at it from the uh, more advanced country perspective. Uh, although countries like China is also taking a leading role in being in that technological lead. But when you look at countries such as Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries, I call them digital latecomer. We are already latecomer when it comes to Industry 2.0. We are latecomers when it comes to manufacturing. And in academic terms, when you refer to latecomers, you refer to countries that have to learn from others. Uh, you rely on uh, export-led uh, models, you rely on inward foreign direct investment so that you can learn from the inward investor who brings in technology and all that. That's the kind of the traditional latecomer as we know it in academia. But now we are also seeing digital latecomer syndrome for this country. And what I mean by that is that this country, if they are not uh, preparing themselves well enough in terms of getting into the human resource to take part in innovation driven activities. They would see technology as a tool. Um, we all know, you also mentioned that technology and digitalization is just an enabler. The answer does not lie in the tool, but the answer lies in connecting the dot that the tool has now provided. And I think how firms in these emerging economies make the most out of digitalization in the developing country context is a challenge that uh, emerging countries like Thailand face. How many grabs are we going to see from countries like Thailand and Malaysia? Grab is the uh, regional competitor to Uber. And when we see Thai firms and SME talk about uh, digitalization, we still see online economy being uh, presented as an alternative channel of distribution. 
Yes, there are opportunities out there and there are firms that are doing leading technology. But the majority of firms uh, are still trying to figure out how they are to cope with the digital uh, economy. So for this, I raised that uh, one of the first challenges for countries like Thailand is how do we cope with be being digital latecomer as well as already latecomer in other technological areas. The second syndrome I see, uh, I am concerned, is what I call here the Asian syndrome. What I mean Asian syndrome is that these are the countries and the areas that are usually known to derive their competitive advantage from low cost. This uh, derive from low labor costs, low production costs, and that's why countries like Thailand and other neighboring countries attract inward foreign direct investment. And now we are trying to move beyond this kind of the cost advantage uh, strength to something that is more innovation driven and into cutting edge technology. So there is a gap there for many firms, even among our lead firms, the, lead, the biggest firm in the stock market. They're still not at the cutting edge technology. They're still the user, the uh, absorber of uh, technology. So those are my two concerns at the firm level. I'm not trying to be too negative, but I just think that when we look at digital uh, economy and digital disruption, we also need to look at how prepared we are. And the given context of Thailand, there are the issues that I would like to raise here. I move now to lesson number two at the industry level challenges. And here, again, tied up to my last point earlier on the Asian syndrome of focusing on uh, the cost advantage uh, for, for countries in Asia. I call this a factory Asia syndrome. What I mean by factory Asia syndrome is that when you look at the value chain of global industries, to be, be it uh, automotive, be it uh, electronic, countries in Asia tend to be active and participating in this value chain at the lower end of the value creation. So they are active in the manufacturing, the most standardized part of the operation of the value chain. Not always the most value added uh, part of the value chain. So when the changing nature of industry is taking place through uh, digitalization, you highly mentioned, you clearly mentioned the platform economy, and you also mentioned the other aspect of the changing uh, buyer the, the measure of industries are changing, already changing because of the va global value chain, but now changing even faster because of all this platform economy that is taking place. What would happen to countries that have long followed the development model that relies on this export led playing the part of factory Asia? Right now, the conflict between US and China may make Southeast Asian country a little bit more positive because firms that have located in China are looking for places to relocate away from China and out of China. And that gives some kind of hope that countries in Southeast Asia might attract more inward foreign direct investment to their countries. But still, this is the same old model of relying on inward foreign direct investment to put in more infrastructure and to put in more technology. So I think that that is something that we have been used to for a long time and we need to uh, get out of this factory Asia uh, mentality to be able to ride the digital wave for the next uh, S-curve industries. And the next one I uh, address it as industry level challenge is what I call the conglomerate syndrome. If you look at most of the largest firms in Thailand and Southeast Asia, you would see the firms that are uh, very diversified. One of the group that Thai people and people who are based in Thailand know quite well is the CP group. Uh, this is an agribusiness group that start first with chicken vertical integration and uh, diverse, just to give Anna some background. They diversify into many other areas, including uh, telecommunication. And now they are thinking of getting into high-speed rail network and infrastructural related activities. 
So when you see firms that are the ones who are most capable of investing in innovation, are actually looking at choices of opportunistic kind of uh, expansion into other industries because opportunities allow them to do so. I call this a conglomerate syndrome because they might not put the money in the area where it is most needed, which is the uh, research and uh, development and innovation activities. This is a problem for large firms. On the opposite side, we are also seeing that SME is experiencing the same challenge of where to focus along the value chain. If they are just the operator and manufacturer, how can they compete with uh, countries and firms that are cheaper in neighboring countries? And if they are just provider of the most standardized uh, operation and activities, how do they compete with automation? Bank tellers is the one that is most likely to be taken away by automation. Uh, in my class, I use this. I suggest to my students that uh, they should use. They should look at this website called "Will Robot Take My Job?" And this is done by the BBC, and they would tell you what is the likelihood of your job being replaced by uh, automation and robots. And uh, in my in the business school one of the area that is most likely to be replaced is actually accountants and financial uh, tellers and uh, those who work in banking. And at the same time, business school is still seeing the number of students going into accounting and finance is the most uh, numerous number of the students. So it's some kind of interesting. And by the way, I look at professors, we are still less likely to be replaced by robots but the teaching, the online, is soon to be replaced by video and everything. So some part of our job can be automated, as you uh, clearly suggested. So those are the kind of issues that are facing uh, the industry. What to do, and where to do, and where to go. And uh, given the context of Thailand and emerging economies, we do not always see the ecosystem of the uh, most value-added activities taking place on the ground. And that would be one of the challenge for countries like Thailand. And here I come to the third level of challenge, the country level challenges. And this I refer more specifically to Thailand. And I think the first syndrome that we see in Thailand when we talk about digitalization is what I call the 4.0 syndrome. When we talk about 4.0 syndrome, we seem to be thinking that now we are getting into the next S-curve. I call this S-curve as a, I don't know what S stands for, but I think it's kind of sexy. You know, it's a, it's a uh, automotive and all this used to be the old sexy and the new, the new sexy would be the robotic, the uh, medical hub and the medical equipment. So I'm sure that S stands for something that is not just sexy, but it, it sounds sexier when you talk about robotic. Thailand would now be the hub of the robotic at the EEC. I think it is important to have a vision, and I agree that uh, it's good to have vision to go toward the new S-curve industry. But we should not overlook the more basic industries. We should not overlook the 1.0, which is agriculture. We should not overlook the 2.0, which is light manufacturing, and the 3.0, which is more heavy manufacturing. I just had a great opportunity to visit uh, New Zealand, a country that is very much uh, driven by high-tech service domestically, although the, uh, the product that New Zealand is known abroad tend to be more uh, commodities in agriculture. But when you look at agriculture in New Zealand, this is very much a 4.0 agriculture with the kind of technology that goes in there, precision farming, uh, satellite uh, uh, technology to help with uh, where irrigation is and uh, where the fertile land are, and irrigation system that is very sophisticated and tech, uh, and advanced. These are the things that we need to be looking at when we talk about Thailand getting toward 4.0. We should not be just 4.0 syndrome and be uh, focusing on all the new sexy industry without looking how the uh, other industries can benefit from digitalization. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned policy because I think the second challenge that we face at the country level for Thailand is what I call the silo syndrome. 
this I refer specifically to the policy framework, which I think that uh, we, although we have a good plan, we still don't always think out of the box when it comes to policy framework. And I would just refer to three specific policies that I think need to be perceived in a more holistic manner. We have been looking at inward foreign direct investment for a long time. We have the uh, Board of Investment, BOI, to attract investors, to give incentive to investors. And we have the Ministry of Industry to look at industrial policy, how to develop supply network, supply chain uh, to leading industries such as automotive. And now we are seeing that Thai firms are starting to expand overseas. So we are seeing some policy that is addressing outward foreign direct investment from Thailand. And just to link all this together, these are three areas of policy that need to be think in a more integrative way to benefit from the kind of the digitalization. Because without a strong industrial uh, supply chain, without a strong supplier network, you would not get, uh, you would not attract the most sophisticated inward investors. And without a strong development of the uh, supply network in the country and regionally, you are not going to have multinational that is strong enough to go out to establish their own regional and global value chain. So to see this policy in a more holistic and integrative manner, especially in the digital disruption uh, age and uh, era, I think it's a challenge for the Thai uh, government uh, policy. If we are talking about education reform, when academics have to submit anything that is research uh, proposal or research uh, report, we still have to make at least 10 hard copies of the report. And it can be something that I think uh, SMC Sassin Management Consultant knows well. That, uh, we do a lot of uh, all these hard copies just to present to each of the ministries. You know, so, uh, the kind of paperless uh, cloud government is still there. And this brings me to the last point of my concern at the country level, which is the what I call the digital have and the digital have not syndrome. When we look at uh, digitalization and people who are able to ride the digital wave, they would be the winner in the new game. But we would have a lot of losers who are not the one who have equal access and equal benefits to uh, all the things that digital disruption can bring. And this also refers to big business that would be uh, the one who can see more opportunities, invest more in uh, a lot of the uh, more expensive technological infrastructure. But I do agree that uh, it should be digital disruption is something that would lower cost for uh, international expansion and we will see more smaller firms trying to leapfrog in some area. But we can still not uh, overlook the digital have and digital have not in the social and the society because that would lead to uh, domestic political unrest and also what we are seeing in the world today. Thank you. A couple of points that I would draw on, I don't have a presentation today and I probably will speak on draw on from, from many of the points that I would agree um, from Dr. Anna, um, to Dr. Shai Pong, and Dr. Pavita. I'm glad to hear that Dr. Shai Pong, who is the, one of the brains behind the 4.0, admitting that we are 1.0. <laughs> it would be interesting to see how Kun Som Kit would come up um, later on because it is true that the, the Thailand lacks uh, the implementation of some of these uh, good ideas and policies. And I'm sure if I were to ask you in this room to put up your hands if you have read the national strategic um, initiation, the so-called 20-year plan. Any of you have read it? Only two, three person, and they're all academics, and one soldier who's read it. So, so as I say, uh, do take time to read it, because the plan is very, very detailed and intense, and laid out a lot of the key minds. There are English versions, which I'm sure you excellencies can, can get hold of the copy, and a shorter version, by the way that you can see where the actual digital plans are. And I get very worried when I see um, potential aspiring um, um, future um, politicians of my age, I'm 42 years old, and nobody bothers to see where the plan before criticizing it. But the actual digital disruption, as um, Dr. Anna pointed out correctly, you know, it has, the technology has no borders. 
and it's come in a fast and furious manner. And data is the gold mine of all this 4.0 industrial revolution. I think there's a lot of examples where countries have been able to um, keep the data in a better format and then monetize it, use it for the greater good, for the public goods and services better. Um, Singapore, some of you may have been to Singapore recently. There's a company called Grab. As you all know, public services are best run by private sector. The Singapore government, the Minister, Ministry of um, Transport, have allowed the use of traffic data for private firms to use this data. And what does Grab do? Grab developed an application called Grab Bus. It's a ride sharing service. In Thailand, we have an app called Pamba Shareway and a couple of apps which are also hail ride um, sharing services. Um, but in Singapore, Grab is legalized. In Thailand, it's still illegal, by the way, um, despite the whole country probably almost using it. But um, the Grab bus itself was able to be used in such a powerful tool in Singapore because you get to use the traffic data. So you know where, to, where the most people are going to be going. So say you're coming to Hong Kong today, you may come in from uh, the other part of town, from the history of finance, from um, Lat Prao, from different areas. The app allows to make you to share the ride together, save the cost of uh, travel, um, you know, spare the pollution in the air, and of course lessen the traffic on the ground. So the use of data actually by government can be an extremely powerful tool. I saw one point there about um, transparency um, and of course ethics and governance. It is very important when you see the future economy uh, is being driven by technology, but it's very difficult to, to share or find a common um, standards on internet governance. And the lack of morale compass on this ground is, is definitely um, tricky. I, I'm in the camp I share with Dr. Anna that I'm a more liberal. Um, I agree that you should let the innovation run ahead and then the rule of law can come in and maybe um, fairly distribute, like how you see um, the events of Google and Facebook in the US where, where clearly there they let innovation runs and then when things get a bit out of hand, the data, then the, the lawyers that come in. In Europe, likewise, I'm sure a lot of companies have ran ahead and then the competition um, body comes in and clamp down, not just on data, but on tax. You know, uh, we haven't talked about tax in details, and maybe it's a sensitive topic, but in order for us to realize the true, I call it the three E's, the efficiency, the equality, and the using of the e-commerce platform, you need to have a credible uh, fiscal policy to go along with it. And maybe because of my finance background, I'll share you a couple of points on, on where the challenges are. Um, the tax structure in many countries at the moment does not allow um, for a, a conducive um, areas for, for fair and open competition. Um, some of you may know that some of the world's biggest company, and Dr. Anna showed you a great presentation, that some of the world's largest company are now technology-driven company. How many of them pay tax properly in, in the territory they operate in? You know, Line, Google, and Facebook are the three largest uh, companies in the technological field in Thailand, and I'm sure in Southeast Asia. How much tax do they pay in Thailand? Close to zero. Whether it's to do with permanent establishment, whether it's to do with um, the rules, the non-rules at the World Trade Organization, or what binding rules there are. Other countries in ASEAN are collecting tax. So Indonesia walks up to Google and says, look, you owe us one billion US dollar worth of tax. Pay or get out. Google, of course, paid and then stay on. Thailand is a country that you know has fiscal strength and we have low debt to GDP level. But over the next five years, 10 years, the profile of debt is on the rise. There's a massive infrastructure investment projects that you will see being put on. So it is definitely not prudent to say that we are not able to collect the tax, the targets of level of tax. And not only just collecting the amount of money, it's creating the fairness in the system. The fairness I'm talking about here is competition because as you all know, the competition in Thailand, the economy has been growing at very subpar level. If you average it out, the last five or ten years has been quite soft. And the reason is because the big guys keep getting bigger, the small guys, SMEs and the startups don't get anywhere. In fact, they may be contracting. There is a dual track economy here. And at the heart of that inequality is how you allocate capital, how you allocate loans. When the banks who are controlling the economy make hundred billions of profit a year, top four banks, if you look at the revenues earnings, more than 100 something billion baht a year if the top four CEOs go on holiday to Bahamas or Humor, do nothing for a year. 
the bank's profit will be the same. There's clearly something interesting there because, and you know, I love Bank of Thailand and they are, they are, they're the reason why I exist in the world today. Uh, many of you don't know why, but my parents met at the Bank of Thailand and they fell in love and of course they, they have me afterwards. So, so I have this full respect and love to the Bank of Thailand. But the challenges of the regulators in today's digital world is one where you can wear the hats of a developer of the new industries as much as the hat of a stability and governing the rule of law to make sure the bad guys get punished. That, that role is being the balance, it's being challenged and quite tricky. My regulator, I'm on the governor of the Stock Exchange of Thailand and the CEO of a security company. My regulator, the SEC, Security Exchange Commission, they've organized the first financial technology challenge, FinTech challenge, back a couple of years ago. The person who won it was the person who wrote a code writing blockchain program where you can trade directly, peer to peer, without the need to come through the stock exchange or the broker. Very cute regulator I have, right? So he can just basically regulate it out, that's out of the way. And the heart of the digital asset law, for of course in sub-digital, is to create more competition for stock exchange because it will allow the setup of digital asset exchange. It will allow the setup of the ICO portal, the initial coin offering portal that would be basically the investment banking 4.0 in the world where you can raise funds and capital through the cryptocurrencies based on blockchain. And while I welcome the ideas of doing this and is putting things in the rule of law, as you all know, the more rule of law does not bring justice. Often it brings in more inequality and more corruption and less competitiveness in a country. A country like Korea has been going through phases of regulatory guillotine, trying to cut, cut. One new law introduced, you cut two or three law. I'm not sure how it is in Portugal or in New Zealand. But innovation usually gets strangled by too many regulations, too many you know, little law within the ministry and so on and so forth. So it, 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 it is um, a little bit um, counterproductive to have a digital asset law at the wrong juncture, especially when it brings tax. So if you trade on cryptocurrency, you get tax by at least 15% or income tax, which could be higher. If you want to raise fund, raise capital through an ICO, you get taxed by 27%. This is for startups to raise capital. For a big company to raise money on stock exchange of Thailand, zero tax. Again, something about inequality here, which is a, I hope they will address the issue because when competition um, of regulation, they do look cross-border. They go to Singapore, 0% tax. And why 0% tax? Because there's no law on digital asset. So they allow, sure, the cost of li living, the cost of doing business in Singapore may be a little bit higher than in Thailand, but the rule of law that opens up a lot of this opportunity for the new economy companies are definitely going in that um, direction. Um, in Thailand, I talk about the profitability of the financial sector, the banks, the big banks who are controlling a chunk of the profits. You want to see more efficiency in, the, in, the, in this uh, financial sector. You want to see competition. Um, and competition, I mean the financial technology firms who are beginning to request to apply for peer-to-peer -peer lending license, P2P. And the P2P license, as you know, is basically, if, um, on this side, has too much access cash left. You can join um, this blockchain system, and then you lend it to the other side, which have great ideas, but not enough cash. A company called Jmart, which is a um, largest mobile retailers and electric good retailers in Thailand, have launched a platform called Ba, Ba, like PH, um, through the company subsidiary called JVC. They initiate the blockchain platform where to enable to matching directly without going through banks of funds, of loans that can be done on the blockchain platform and not based on traditional credit quality. It's based on the new alternative credit scoring system. So it would be based on your usage of your mobile phone. You may be using the phone to do prepay or postpay. You may be doing more calls abroad. You may be traveling more. You may be use application, download on the phone, play games, buy this. It's your lifestyle that's become your credit score. Taking this back a little bit to the 0.4 mode, there's a couple of provinces in Thailand that use alternative credit score to extend credits, to give loans. And this is actually going back in the old days, ancient ways of lending, of a traditional way when, you know, JP Morgan, when he founded JP, um, it's actually to lend based on character, based on trust. And, 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 and this is at the heart of the whole digital economy for me because to, to, to create an environment where 
the parties can trust the system and still have the credit. It comes from your character. The province in Thailand, they call it Panakan Heng Kwam Di, the good character bank. And by good character, it means that the local villagers get together and have a saving pool of funds. And they can use this fund as a central village fund. And when someone has a great business idea, they come to this village fund and they get the money loaned out to them, not based on if they have money in their bank account, because they probably don't have a bank account, not based on their monthly salary or income, because they probably are startups or you know, kind of freelance. They don't have a steady monthly annual income. Um, but based on if they're honest, if they're on time, if they're helping the community, if their actions are you know, impacting society in a positive manner. And actually the NPL has been very low for this kind of banks and trials that's happened in a few um, Tambon and provinces in Thailand. But leveraging on that kind of old 0 0.4 economy to use it onto a blockchain platform is very powerful because blockchain is a, a tool that you cannot go back and tamper with. You cannot go back and tweak and change the record once it's recorded. So if it's recorded that this person has been trusted, if Kun Pasit Pirom has uh, borrowed the money from me and I lend him and he returned on time, that trust has been established and recorded into the system. You can, I cannot, anyway, he cannot go back and change it, whether you know, his other colleagues you know, or his uh, competitor may not go and change it and say, oh, Kun Pasit did not return the money. It cannot be changed. So the blockchain and the lending platform can, can bring powerful through where your, your characters, your IDs and the way you do things can, can be a powerful one. Um, I want to touch a little bit on artificial intelligence because AI is where the biggest challenge and the concern is, and the real, real concern. The, the computing power under the quantum computing, if any of you have not done or checked out the offices of a few companies that have quantum computing power, I suggest you do. In Thailand, there's a few companies um, like Satcoin and TDAX that are going to be running and using it. And you should check out some of the businesses, I mean, SAS, Kelcom, Microsoft, SAP, you name it. Some of these guys are making a lot of investment, not just in artificial intelligence per se, not just in machine learning, but in the quantum computing and the next level of the whole 5G technology. Because what that means is that the huge amount of data can be taken together and anal analyzed. The whole market analytics, how you can make sense of what this data means, and what you can use it to do. So it's not just going to be grab bus, it will be investment ideas. In my, in my world, I have to get up in the morning and pick up a phone and call an institutional client who is a human, saying, ah, Mark, let's say Mark Mobius, Mark, we should be buying PTT, one of the largest oil and gas company, the oil price is going up. Now today, there is a program on both sides that they will trade and match orders without me even having to pick up a phone and call my clients. The algorithm, direct market access, black box, is already happening today. So in the next one or two or three years, it will be faster. And when you trade in a stock market, you're not trading against humans at the moment. You're trading against robo-advisor, against some of the algorithms, some of the program trading. And some things are very fast, the high frequency trading. Sometimes you saw the book called Flash Boy that was written and, and, and it, it shows the advantages that the machines have over humans because when the stock is crashing and going down, you're not gonna be wanting to buy the stock. You'll be running away, whereas the machine is rubbing their hands and ready to, to take the advantage. So some of this um, provide the, the challenge, but also it provides some market liquidity, the efficiencies, and whatnot. So like it or not, the actual human intelligence, in, as, as um, Dr. Lehman has mentioned, you know, the repetitive tasks, you will, the jobs will be changed, you will be taken away. I'm hoping that your organization are already upgrading the skills because even though you're in the service industry, you may do some you know, repetitive tasks and those will be replaced by the machine. But the ability and the skills and one thing that Thailand has, the huge strength of Thailand is a 0 0.4, it's not 4.0. And by 0 0.4, I mean Thai people do have the strength of empathy, of compassion, of having this community where if Dr. Titin and PJ feel um, ill and sick, you know, I do feel sad and sick too. If you get promoted uh, to be a minister one day, which some academics do, you know, then I am so joyful and, and congratulate and be happy for him. So this kind of mutual kind of compassion, empathy feels that Thailand has is an inherent, very strong cultural um, economy strength that the country has that we have to use better. And the strength lays in the fact that if you look at a lot of the nomads and the court writers around the world, where do they want to live? Where was Agoda founded? It was founded in Phuket. 
by a bunch of group of computer code writers who wrote Agoda in Phuket. At the moment in Chiang Mai, it's become a new almost heaven for like Silicon Valley, the new tech geeks who are living out of Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai. I just got back from Chiang Rai recently. But you'd be surprised how they linked up a lot of the uh, cities there where it's very serene, very you know, calm, quiet, almost like slow life. But a lot of the court writers, the world, the international court writers are there. But what, what happened to the rule of law? The rule of law at the moment makes them have to, to leave Thailand once every, I don't know, three, four months to get the visa stamp and then come back again. So the ease of doing business sometimes is not great when a country, yes, have a nice charm to attract some of the world's top programmers to the country. And I'm sure the EEC, the Eastern Economic Corridor, you will be seeing the ability to attract some of the world's largest uh, investors to come to Thailand. Elon Musk didn't come to the cave just to help a few kids in the cave. He already sent his number two deputy two or three times before that to set up one of the largest Tesla plant in Thailand. He's been meeting with Dr. Biche, Dr. Somkit, um, and Dr. Uttamat, the Minister of Industry, two times. So Tesla is looking to set up one of the largest ASEAN plants potentially in Thailand, and the cars will be digitalized. But the rule of law may need to change because Thailand has FTA with China. China has a very, almost a 0% uh, electric car um, export um, um, with Thailand and ASEAN countries. Japanese companies are complaining, as you know, they don't get that privilege on the tax front. So sometimes it's a soft infrastructure that needs, uh, that needs to, be, to be upgraded. Um, on the last point, I think my time is running out, but on the actual point that I, that I feel Thailand uh, will be looking at in terms of developing the, the human resources capability to take on some of this, uh, the country level challenges because we have the geographical advantage in a 0.4 that I mentioned to you. But whether on the actual human resources capability and it comes from the mindset of the people, the mindset of the civil servants, the mindsets of the regulators, how far they want us to go. You know Thailand is a country where we value uh, smart students, student kids who are, uh, get good grades in school. But we don't so much value kids who fail or business entrepreneur who dare to dream and dare to fail and fail and fail. Again. And often innovation, especially in the digital world, come from trying, failing, trying again, and then fail, fail, fail. You may fail a few times and then you're successful. You know, and then you kind of... Thailand is a country sometimes where I hope we can change our mindset on this because guys like um, Kun Donni Harinsu and Kun Jun, who co-founded Omise, O-M-I-S-E, and go and check out their business, those of you who live in Thailand. Omise runs one of the largest online payment gateway on the blockchain system. And Jun and, and Donny Harinsu wanted to raise funds onshore in Thailand. They couldn't. In fact, some of the regulation prohibited them from doing so. They had to go to Switzerland, raising capital in Switzerland, came back to Thailand, get given Startup of the Year Award last year from our Prime Minister Prayut. And afterwards, everyone, oh, well, we say it's great. You know, every ministry is running after them. Um, but it's so funny. And afterwards, the Prime Minister also say that cryptocurrency is a fraud. And he forgot that he gave the Startup of the Award to Omise, who raised capital through cryptocurrency in Switzerland, you know, almost a uh, hundred million US dollar plus. So sometimes the whole um, big picture for me, I think there's a good heart from this government who wants to, to, to walk the talk and to do what they've laid out in the national 20-year um, strategy plan. Um, often it will need uh, the effort from the private sector the doers to actually force them to implement some of these changes. You saw the competition law being upgraded and that's a welcoming because some of the smaller firms, startups and whatnot cannot compete with the bigger guys. They all get taken over. You know, next year, one of Thailand's largest mobile operator will launch a blockchain lending platform. You know, so again, they are extending from the big guys and lending this on their, on their mobile um, um, platform. And a few other firms, the Stock Exchange of Thailand, even myself, I'm quit being critical of the SET who who has the monopoly position um, at the moment. But in the future, there will be digital asset platform where the tokenization of the whole securities um, will be moving on that side. So for me personally, the future is already now and it's up to the human who are using this technology to, to dare to open up their minds and their hearts to actually allow some of this innovation to prosper and rise and born and being effective before coming to restrict and regulate Two question. The first one uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, how have you give uh, knowledge 
to your peers in the academic, in the political world and so on, of Portugal, to raise that knowledge and awareness to your level so that they can do the policy implementation and so on, you know. And second, in relation to that, how has Portu Portugal uh, positioned itself in this changing world? And I would like to cite maybe the Netherlands. They want to do maybe four things as a food expert, water management uh, center for connectivity and into the biotech, or even Israel. Okay, it's the new modern agricultural thing using less water and so on. And then become the digital world, the computer world and so on, and the startup company, where they have hundreds and hundreds of companies that are patented worldwide, only second to the United States. I'm confused by my present government with so many of these S curves, which I do not believe, and, and so on, because we are not concentrating in any particular area. Thank you. In, in Thailand, I think the efforts from the government to walk the talk will be important and from the guys who are at the top in the organization or the whole kind of experience within the culture within both the organized big private sector and the civil servants because really if those people um, change some of the mindsets in, 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 to give you an example, raising awareness means having new right correct set of goals and targets and implementing them. At the moment when you talk about um, new economy. Many of us talk about it. There's a lot of set lectures on this digital economy, but then people don't go and implement and they don't go and set the targets we need because if you use the GDP as a target, which I'm sorry, I'm not criticizing anyone, but the government keep harping on about how good the economy is with the GDP. GDP measures the quantity of growth, not the quality of growth. And if we're not going to have the right KPI, the right tools kit to measure this um, new economy, we're not going to get anywhere. You can use a PISA index and a, you can weight a few index and do a few things, whether it's to do with um, the environment, whether it's to do with the digital literacy, the DQ, whether it's to do with the, the PISA index on education, whether it's to do with Gini coefficient, sure we're not the world's most in eco, uh, inequality country in the world as some press reported. But I think first the awareness must come from the actual um, a forcefulness to implement some of these new KPIs and hard targets and then for the civil servants to, to do that, you know, to follow the new KPI. Because at the moment they're working with, they're working with uh, I call it the marketing slogans, but not real hard new KPI uh, credible targets to achieve. And, and if those are not set, you're not, get it. You're not, you're not gonna get it. Um, I, I think corporates and I think um, even you know, embassies, even civil servants, it's actually the doing to walk the talk. I mean, I go to a lecture at the SAPA, at the um, parliament, and this is a week after the Prime Minister told everyone to go digital, to not use uh, ID card, national ID card. After my talk, oh, the head of parliament, Kun Pon Pet, come and say, thank you, great talk, great talk. And his deputy come and say, Kun Prin, can I have your national ID card to do the photocopy and sign it? So, <laughs> so it's like, and, and this is not just, doesn't just happen in this parliament. I'm on the board of the Electronic Transaction Development Agency, ETA, ETDA, in the Ministry of Digital Economy. And after my meeting, after the board meeting, they give me cash, believe it or not, and ask me to sign the paper that I received cash on my, I'm like, you, we, we're the board of ETA, and like, we're doing this ourselves? So, it's, so it's, it's almost like, for, and same as NIA, same as National Innovation Agency, only the Stock Exchange of Thailand is not, not uh, is paying digi digitally at the moment. But, but, but I think some of the things has, has to be implemented and enforced. I mean, we talk about blockchain a lot, but how many of you in the room have actually gone out there and actually Think about what are the pain points of your business, of your daily life, of your daily, whether it's in the embassy or your business, and actually, you know, try. I mean, Dr. Kun Kasit is in the, the Democrat Party, which recently held a leadership election using blockchain to choose the leader, to, to vote. Sure, there may be some imperfection, but that way it raised awareness. People are like, whoa, Democrat Party, the oldest party in Thailand, is using blockchain for voting to vote the new leaders. And, you know, despite some little hiccups here and there, it's more human errors to set the time incorrectly rather than the problem with the technology itself. But you know, things like that I think would, would go a long way to actually walk the talk and do it. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, we would do better by saying that we are going to focus on this and that industry. What I would like to see more in terms of going forward is for Thailand to really understand 
where we are in the value chain of several industries and know where to target. And rather than picking industries and uh, have more plans that look at different segments, if we are looking at uh, policies to improve the kind of the second and third tier uh, companies, how do we promote them to become more value added? And if we are already have some companies that are at the frontier of technology, like what can bring mentioned, how do we promote further expansion and uh, sort of the, the kind of commercialization? So I'm not sure that in this kind of digital disruption, I would like to see Thailand pick industries because knowing from the record of our implementation, I think it would lead to perhaps more uh, connections and network being uh, one of the key factors for determining that. So that would be my answer. Just back to the point, you know, uh, all of this variation, I would say, you know, come, up, come down to what Thailand can, what are the, our strengths. I think, you know, uh, I agree with, with, with you know, for example, there are three things I think that Thailand, I think, have a uniqueness in terms of, of, of our resources. For example, first of all, the culture, you know, that can, you know, by playing with this culture thing, that, you know, there's derivative of business that, 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 that can come up to with, with, with the Thai culture, for example, tourism, uh, medical health, and things like that, you know. Secondly, I think we are, we have been a manufacturing base, so we have a network of manufacturing companies so can we leverage that? So robotics, something like that, that's a derivative of, of the strength we have. Of course, it needs to be upgraded. And the last one is biodiversity, right? We, I think one of the country in the world that have, you know, highest level of biodiversity. So that, you know, come up into like, you know, all biofuels, chemicals, uh, pharmaceutical industry that we can develop upon. So that, that's three things that I think we can leverage on the strength that we have. In terms of doing it, I think this is the hard part you know, the government trying to, you know, put the flagship, you know, in EEC, that's a key area, a lot of investment going on there. Uh, my personal belief is that's a still big, big gap, you know, from moving from Thailand, let's say 3.0 or 2.0 to 4.0. That's a big challenge. And I think, you know, uh, and, and action is it's, it's critical uh, with the chain of the government, and things like that, you know, how Thailand can ensure the stability of this investment. Of course, we have 20 year plan, you know, uh, but you know, who, who knows, we can be changed, right? So that's, that's uh, my life part. This is a very challenging and very rich um, area of discussion, so I'll be in the cell very short, because there, were, there, were also, there was also the other question on, you know, how we persuade other politicians, you know, to sort of have this long-term focus and how do we foster uh, implementation and this necessarily engaging the private sector and other stakeholders. It's very difficult, you know. I have to confess something to you. I'm a total outsider of the party, party politics. Probably this exchange might short, this also explains a lot. And I've been, you know, it's been an incredible experience and I would say rather successful. But so I have this genuine concern on long-term mission and on um, implementation, really, because I entered halfway through a government mandate. So there was only two years. I ended up staying 15 months. So, um, so I inherited several policies that were already conceived, so in terms of announcements, of proposals, and so it was up to me to implement them. Just to cut a long story short, uh, in the six taxes we have for Industry 4.0, so 64 measures, and I set into implementation in less than one year, uh, 60 out of 64, 94% of the measures. So that was my concern. And I tried to implement a more evidence-based policy, but it wasn't easy. And when I, I give you just a couple of very quick examples, I was very interested in Portugal being an innovator also in regulatory terms. This is not easy. And I have the regulators on my side, which is very interesting. So in order to develop some free tech zones and sandboxes, sort of to promote innovation in the long term. This was very difficult in terms of political negotiation because different members of government have total conflicting interests. For example, when we try to promote a free tech zone for drones, uh, then uh, the interests were very conflicting also for autonomous vehicles, for example, for experiments in health, etc. So I was very concerned with this in promoting digital innovation hubs. That links with implementation. 
no government can uh, be the, the sole end out save and the main driver because this, several of these measures, most of them were driven by the private sector, also with the collaboration of a, a vast array of uh, public and private institutions. Um, and uh, the, uh, I have to say the private sector engaged in it very well. The public sector uh, with a symmetric engagement. Some, so in terms of some of, for example, in terms of innovation at the government level, Portugal is a pioneer and a leader, like the way citizens engage uh, in terms of uh, innovation in public administration. But then on the other hand, on the interface with companies, my diagnosis was that we needed some big reform in some institutions. I managed to reform the venture capital company, the main venture capital company operating in Portugal. But for example, in terms of the largest, some of the largest institutions, this is very, very has proved very difficult. So implementation really, I think the key is really to promote engagement and have this openness of mind and hearts. But there are so many hurdles. Uh, and the legislation is really uh, something that we need to look at very carefully. Uh, there were other dossiers that are very important because we are very different than Thailand in terms of size. So, so we don't have people to sustain the growth in terms of numbers. So for us automation and robotization is very important. But also because our problem is rather the opposite, is that we are now after a violent crisis reaching again full employment level and the digital companies are going there, the multinationals, and we don't have enough people. So I try to promote also, we, we managed to launch the startup visa, but we are trying to promote, hopefully next year will be the tech visa also to import talent. It's uh, one of our main challenges. In terms of positioning, well, and so much remains to be said on this first point, but in terms of positioning uh, for us, um, I don't think we can have a focus and be comparable to cases like, for example, Israel, etc., that have been no doubt very successful, for example, on cybersecurity and entrepreneurship. For us, and we don't know very well because the key sectors are changing, and so it can be one today, can be another tomorrow. So I'd say that for us, rather the, the important aspect would be, also like Professor Pananon said, to move towards high value added activities across sectors, across sectors. And uh, one of my uh, modest mantras was innovation in tradition. How to bring the fruits of digitalization to the so-called traditional sectors. And I have to say in Portugal, some of the most innovative sectors and companies are within the so-called traditional sectors, like metals and machinery, textiles and clothing, footwear, etc. Tremendously, tremendously innovative, some of them. So, um, in terms of positioning, I would say that we need, both in services and in manufacturing, to really bring up the value added. And I see that happening, fortunately. But the drivers of this are the companies, the private sector. And it's very interesting that even from the point of view of small and medium companies, even micro enterprises, they were so eager to digitalize and modernize. Um, they were really, uh, and I could say that, I could say, uh, I can say this because I saw that in local. They were really eager to modernize, but it's our president of the Republic a few, a couple of months ago said something uh, at one of these uh, innovation meetings, and he said, uh, international meeting in Portugal, and he said, yes, uh, uh, in terms of manufacturing, we are moving towards the 4.0, but we cannot do that with a legislation that is 1.0, or with a government and government institutions that are still uh, very bureaucratic. And you know, I say this because I see lots of goodwill and people trying to change, but there are factors of rigidity, and this is not only in Portugal, uh, all throughout Europe, because I would go to all these European fora, uh, is the case. Uh, and so, in terms of positioning, this is not an easy thing, and in Portugal we haven't been usually very specific on that, but I would say moving up in the in value added would be the key. I would like to thank uh, Kumprin. I know you're in high demand of sharing your time, your expertise from the ground with us. Uh, Dr. Chaipong also uh, trekking across campus from the Assassin Management uh, Consulting. 
uh, your first time speaking here, so welcome. It will not be the last time. Dr. Parita Brandon, thank you very much for your contribution. And finally, uh, Dr. Anna Tavares Lament, you know, she's here only for today. She arrived yesterday with her family. So she's so gracious and kind enough to share her expertise, uh, scholarly work, and time with us. And her family is waiting outside, so we don't want to keep her. So you can do some sightseeing now. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, happy holidays to everyone. We'll see you next year. Thank you.